Have a seat, everybody. Good morning. How are you doing? Awesome. Okay. Before I start, how many of you have read the book of Job in the Bible? How many of you finished reading the book of Job? Let me see hands. Not so many of you. I hope you can start doing it right away when you get back home. All right? <laughs> you promise? Okay. The story of Job is the most uh, talk about story throughout the ages. This is about a one man who lost so much in his life in such short period of time, but still he found a way to move on with his life. When we talk about the book of Job, we, we usually talk about his suffering and we usually focus on the conversation between God and Satan, right? However, this morning, I'd like to talk about a different side of Job itself. Uh, I'm going to talk about his three friends. How many of you know about Job's three friends? Do you know the names of the, the three friends? Okay. Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. Okay. After Job lost of all his um, wealth, he lost his livestock, he lost his servant, and Job lost his ten children and his health. And also his wife uh, planned to divorce him, to leave him. But the three men were there to support him. And like I said, the names of the three friends are Eliphaz, Bildad, and so far. It's some weird names, right? It's not the common names that we have right now. How many of you want to name your children as Bildad, Eliphaz, and so far? Rosit? <laughs> no, I hope not. It's an ancient name uh, belong to Jewish people. But just as many of our own friends uh, nowadays, uh, not so many friends um, can get everything right, right? But what they got right, they got right in a big way, in a surprising way, like um, the three friends of Job did. Take a look at what um, they did in Job chapter 2, verse 11 to verse 13. If you have your Bible, you can open up with me together in Job chapter 2, verse 11 up to verse 13. And we're going to read it together. Job chapter 2. Okay. One, two, three. When Job's three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and so far the Namathite, heard about all the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Okay, see here that uh, the three friends did really great things for Job when they found that Job was suffered from some kind like, I don't know, like bad things happened to his life. And my sermon's title this morning is called, What Kinds of Friends Are We? What Kinds of Friends Are We? It's a question mark. If we have a friend who experienced suffering and maybe pain in their lives, what is our response and attitudes towards them? Of course, there are two options for us to do here. We can choose to do the right thing to help them, or we can choose the wrong thing to help our friends. The wrong way to help a friend who is suffering is by making false assumptions about why they are suffering. Like the three of Job's friends here, uh, because I'm so kind to you, I see not so many hands lifted up <laughs> to read uh, the book of Job. So I'm so kind to give you the summary between the conversation between Job and his friend, because it's a long chapter from 42 chapters in the book of Job itself, the conversation between the three friends and Job back and forth, back and forth, it take like take up from uh, chapter 4 up to chapter 37. So 30, 33 chapters, the conversation. So I'm so kind, I'll just give you the summary of what they said about. <laughs> okay, let's see what did friends number one said. Uh, the friend number one is called Eliphaz. Say together, Eliphaz. So the first friend and the oldest one came to Job, uh, especially in Job chapter 4. Eliphaz confronted Job by saying that, Job, you are suffered because you had sinned. You committed some sins, maybe right now, maybe in your past life. And Eliphaz made incorrect 
assumption concerning job situation and jobs life by saying that only innocent innocent people would never suffer but the one who are suffering is must be the sin man must be the bad man not the bad man with the wings <laughs> and that's why you are suffered now and being punished because you made some sins in your past life and then the second friend uh, name, his name is Bildad say together Bildad uh, there are three chapters, the conversation between Bildad and Job in Job chapter 8, Job chapter 18, and Job chapter 25, because it's too long, I will not read it for you. Uh, basically, Bildad said that Job is suffering because he refused to repent. Job, you are suffering right now because you refuse to repent from your sin. And then came the third friend, his name is Sofar. Say together, Sofar. Sofar so said in Job chapter 11 throughout Job chapter 20, nine chapters, basically so far said to Job that Job sin deserve more punishment <laughs> rather than what he has experienced right now. Because you has uh, committed sin in your past, you deserve to be suffered, to be punished <laughs> severely than what you uh, experience right now. Wow, those three friends really mean, right? <laughs> if you have those three friends in your life, what are you going to do with them? <laughs> okay, just kidding. So like I said, uh, the option for us uh, to respond to uh, friends or to people who are suffering all, all around us, uh, there are two ways, the wrong way and the right way. Let me speak uh, first, the wrong way to help a friend who is suffered. Sometimes much of our friends said may be theologically correct, but if we, are, if we are trying to help a hurting friend, we must avoid making false assumptions like... Um, making or, or finding, trying to find what is the cause of their suffering. Oh, maybe you did like that. Maybe you committed some sin like that. Uh, most of us making false assumptions about why our friends are suffering. Because false assumptions sometimes can get us into trouble, right? Let me tell you a story. One day, a carpet man, a carpet layer man, uh, replacing some old carpet in the cons uh, consumer's den. And then when the carpet man finished taking down, uh, taking down the new carpet, uh, what I mean taking down is putting the nails onto the new carpet. And then he finished his job, and then he tried to reach uh, his cigarette, which he usually kept in his pocket. But he found nothing in his pocket. Where is my cigarette? And then about that time, he saw a lump like the size of the pack of cigarette in the middle of the carpet that he already put the nail. <laughs> oh, oh, oh my God. And then because that man did not want to get into trouble by taking up the entire carpet and then find the cigarette and then put the nails again, he did not want to repeat his job because he already did well. So after he looked around, nobody was around, he was alone. And then he took out from his bag a hammer. And then he got to the lamp in the middle of the room and then he began to beat the object flat. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> And everything is flat, and he's trying to um, hide his mistake. Okay, looks fine, nothing lump at all, looks perfect. And then he finished, he get out from the, from the house, and then he get on into his truck, and then he found his pack of cigarette on the seat. And then he forget everything, he begin to lit up the cigarette, <sighs> he enjoy it. And then not soon after that, uh, the homeowner ran, hey, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute, don't you leave, don't you leave. Yes, what, what's, what's up, sir? He thought that the homeowner might want to pay him for his job. And then the, uh, out of his surprise, the homeowner asked, did you see my new iPhone 5? I thought I left it somewhere in my den. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know what will happen? By making false assumption that he's lazy to take up all the entire red carpet, the homeowner will deduct <laughs> the price of the new iPhone 5 from his job salary, <laughs> right? Okay, that's, that's, only, that's only imagination, my imagination. So you know that it's a dangerous thing to make false assumption. So shake, shake hands to your neighbor, don't make false assumption. <laughs> False, especially when you are the carpet man, all right? Just don't make any false assumption. <laughs> false assumptions sometimes can lead to false conclusion. And then if we come to the false conclusion, sometimes it can lead 
us to make wrong action. Like the three jobs friends here, they assume that only bad people would suffer, would be punished by God. So when they saw that Job was suffering, they concluded that Job must be hiding some dark and deep sin in his life. So instead of helping and comforting Job, their words only added to Job's misery. For example, let's see here in Job chapter 22, verse 5 to 6. Job 22, verse 5 to 6, and then we jump into verse 9 to 11. Job 22. This is what one of the friends of Job said to him, Eliphaz. Uh, Eliphaz said to Job, is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? Eliphaz accused Job. You demanded security from your brothers for no reason. You stripped men of their clothing, leaving them naked. And then 9 to 11. And you sent widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless. This, that is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you. 11. Why it is so dark you cannot see and why a flood of water covers you. So they make false assumption and that's why they accuse Job of having or hiding some deep dark sin. But as you can see in chapter, if you go back to chapter 1 and chapter 2 in the book of Job, there is no evidence at all that Job did any of those things accused by Eliphaz to him. Instead, God says that Job was an upright man. Job was a blameless man. Even Job was a man who shunned evil, who avoided evil at all at his life. So when you are trying once again to help a friend who is hurting, be careful that you and I do not make the same mistake. Amen, everyone? Okay, now we go to the right option, uh, right way to help a friend who is suffered. As we read in Job chapter 2, verse 11 up to 13, the Job friends actually started out doing what was right. They cried with Job, the three friends uh, sat together, put on their sackcloths, and then poured down the ashes onto their head, and they sat with Job for seven days and night, and saying nothing to him and if i suppose if the story ended like that maybe the three friends could have left and gone home and they remain great friends right but when the three friends started talking they stopped helping even they start hurting job by making false accusation and that should be a lesson to us too i want to share right now five good things to do when we are trying to help a hurting friend but this is not all the five things that we can do, but it is only a good start for us to do. Okay, let's see number one here, the right way to help a friend who is suffer. Number one, what is number one we can do for them? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. All right, number one, we can be there for them. Say it together, we can be there for them. The best thing you can do is just to be present with your friends during the time of their suffering. You don't have to talk to them, just be there. Sometimes the best thing you can do to comfort a hurting friend is just to show up and maybe hug them. Maybe we can practice now, Sam, or you can hug to each other and say, I care about you, all right? We can be there for a hurting friend, okay? And then number two, what the right thing we can do to comfort a friend who is suffered and who is in pain? We can cry with them. Say together, we can cry with them. The best thing Job's friend did uh, was to sit with them, I mean with Job, and they weep along with Job. But the Bible said that uh, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15, Romans 12 verse 15, please, what we can do to a hurting friend. Romans chapter 12 verse 15. Say together with me, one, two, three. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Sometimes tears can communicate our compassion much more than any words do. Is that right? Is that right? So when you see a friend who is hurting, who is in pain, just don't tell that friend, stop crying, stop crying. But instead, we can cry with them. Sometimes they can feel our compassion when we cry when we cry with them okay and number three the right way to help a friend who is suffered we can listen more than we talk say together we can listen more than we talk we can listen more than we talk in james chapter 1 verse 19 open up please james chapter 1 verse 19 james chapter 1 verse 19 
Okay, one, two, three, let's read it together. My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Wow. That's why you know right now why God created us in a perfect replication of God himself that God gave us only one mouth but two ears. Do you know why? Yeah, that's true. So we can listen more than we talk less. That's why maybe some people say, how many of you have a dog at home? Have a dog? How many of you say that my dog is my best friend, right? Some people say or some people claim that a uh, dog is man's best friend. Do you know why? Yeah, <laughs> because we can get mad at the dog. You are naughty. You, you, um, you are spoiled and so on and so on. We can talk anything that we want to a dog, but the dog will not uh, talk us back, right? <laughs> they just kept silent, only bark. Ooh, 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 ooh. Or maybe bite you if the dog disagree with you. Okay, just kidding. And another saying, have you ever heard silence is golden? Right? Say, say, silence is golden. I have different meaning though. Uh, um, my, my interpretation, silence is golden is, you can keep silent and people around you just suspect that you are a fool. Or maybe you can choose to speak and then you prove that you are a fool indeed. <laughs> That's why silence is golden. <laughs> okay. So every hurting or suffered people needs a friend who will listen to him or her. All right. And number four, the right thing to help a friend who is suffered or who is in pain as we can attend to their physical needs. Say together, we can attend to their physical needs. We can attend to their physical needs. One day there are three kids in the school who were trying to explain the symbol of their religions. So the first boy came forward and then showed the other students a star of David. This is my symbol of my religion, the star of David. And then the second boy came forward and then showed the other student around a cross. This is my symbol of my religion. Okay, but the third boy is weird. He came forward, lifted a heavy dish and showed them a spaghetti, a spaghetti dish. This is my symbol of my religion by giving my dish to the hungry people around me. <laughs> Isn't that nice? So the Bible said in Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17, Open up, please. Proverbs 17, 17. Read it together with me. One, two, three. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Uh oh, not, 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 not my brother, all right? Or in another translation, it says that there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. When you have a friend who is suffering, who is in pain, try to stick with them and try be sensitive and care about their physical needs too. Watch over them because sometimes a person who is burdened so much, they forget to take care of their, even their simple physical needs. Even they may forget uh, to eat, they may forget to sleep, they may forget to take a bath or even to take care of their other hygiene needs. There was a man in Alabama who performed this kind of ministry to every family he found in the church who experienced death in the family. What did uh, this man in Alabama do to the family who experienced death in the family? He would take his shoe shine kit and then go to the family who experienced death and then he will try to offer his help to police, to police the shoes of all the family members who would like to attend the funeral. Isn't that a nice thing to do, right? It may be a simple thing. Who cannot, uh, make, the, who cannot uh, make the shoes shiny, right? You can polish your shoes yourself, right? But if you are in such great burden, you experience death in your family, maybe it's not the thing that your friend did to me, but uh, it's because the attention, the care that they give it to you, that means much more that you cannot forget in, in the long, long years in the future, right? It's their attention. It's their love. Okay, and then the number five, the right thing that we can do to a friend who is suffering is we can pray with them. Say together, we can pray with them. We can pray with them. It's always appropriate to pray with somebody. Don't be shy. Uh, there is uh, nothing wrong with praying with somebody, uh, but also don't preach a long, long sermon in your prayer, right? 
Just don't say a long and drawn out prayer. And also don't use this kind of prayer to comfort the hurting friend. It's an opportunity to catch up your prayer life. Oh, maybe, oh man, I forgot to pray this morning when I left my home. Okay, let me get uh, somebody who is hurting and let me get uh, a long prayer with, him, with them. Maybe I can pray, oh Lord, bless Indonesia. Oh Lord, about the Hurricane Sandy. I pray such and such about the election is coming and also about what else? America's condition, about the hungry world in Nicaragua. <laughs> like take up five hours and the friend will <laughs> will sleep. <laughs> okay. Maybe you can do uh, with a hurting friend. You can grab their hands. Maybe you can put your arms around their shoulders, men and men, women with women. And maybe you can ask God, give my friend a strength and peace when they uh, face their burden, when they, save their, uh, they face their suffering, may they see you are in control of everything like that. Because in James chapter 5 verse 16 said that the effectual and fervent prayer of the righteous person avails much. Amen, everyone? Amen. Okay, okay. Um, and then the last part, I read an article written by Linda May Richardson entitled When I Was Diagnosed with a Cancer. She wrote about how seven different friends of hers react um, when she was diagnosed with a cancer. And then Linda wrote in her diary book about how she felt after all the friends gone. Friend number one said, Oh, Linda, I cannot believe that you experienced you got the cancer. All this time, I thought you were so active, you were so healthy. I cannot believe it. How come you got the cancer? Oh, when the friend number one left, Linda wrote, I felt alienated and I felt somehow very different from other normal people. Why I got the cancer? Why all other people did not catch up any cancer? What's wrong with me? And then when she talked about different kind of treatment option, friend number two came to Linda and said, whatever you do, Linda, just don't take the option of getting the chemotherapy that the doctor advised you because it's so poisonous, it's poison. It will poison your body. Just don't take chemotherapy. Maybe friend number two is right, but when uh, friend number two left, Linda wrote, I felt so confused, I felt so scared. And then friend number three came and said, Linda, perhaps God is disciplining your life. Maybe there is some sin in your life. Maybe friend number three is right, but it's not the right time to say like that in, uh, when, when your friend is suffering. And when friend number three left, Linda wrote, oh man, I felt so guilty. I felt so guilty. Maybe I did some wrong that I did not know. Maybe I committed sin, which I did not realize. What should I do? And then came friend number four said, oh, don't worry, Linda. All things work together for all the beloved of God people. And then when friend number four left, uh, there's nothing wrong with what was said by friend number four, actually. But when she left, Linda wrote, I felt so angry. Why everyone enjoyed the blessing? Why everyone got blessed from God? Why I did not get blessed by God? Why all things did not work together for my goodness? And then came from friend number five said, Linda, believe it. If, you, if, if your faith is great enough, you will experience miracle. God will heal you. Believe it. There is nothing wrong, right? With saying the word of God, with quoting some good verse. But I think it's not the right the right time for a suffering friend like that. And Linda wrote after friend number five left, I felt that my faith must not enough to experience a miracle in my life. Oh, I felt so guilty again. And then came friend number six. Well, actually friend number six did not come at all. <laughs> she never came to visit Linda at all. And then Linda wrote, I felt sad and alone. I felt this abandoned by my friend, nobody cared about me. And then friend number seven came and said, oh Linda, I come here to help you, I care about you. I'm here to help you to get through this together. Let me pray for you, a short prayer for you, not a long prayer, right? And then Linda said, uh, when, I, when she left, I felt love. I felt that somebody cared about my problem. I'm not alone in this problem. And may all we be like, um, friend number seven. Amen, everyone? Amen. Nothing's wrong with what's said by the other friends, but let's do the right thing in the right time to the hurting and suffering friend. 
All right. So once again, I know that this day many people are suffering around us. Let us not cho to choose the wrong way to respond by making false assumptions, by trying to find what is the cause of their suffering and try to accuse them. You do like this, you did like that, you committed sin in your, in your life. It's not the right time to say like that to the suffering people, but let's choose the right way to uh, respond to the suffering friend around us. Let's be there with them, let's cry with them, let's listen more than we talk, let's attend to their physical needs and let's pray with them.